The Malayan Campaign was a military campaign fought by Allied and Axis forces in Malaya, from 8 December 1941, 15 February 1942 during the Second World War. It was dominated by land battles between British Commonwealth Army units, and the Imperial Japanese Army with minor skirmishes at the beginning of the campaign between British Commonwealth and Royal Thai Armed Forces. The Japanese had air and naval supremacy from the opening days of the campaign. For the British, British Indian, Australian and Malayan forces defending the colony, the campaign was a total disaster. The operation is notable for the Japanese use of bicycle infantry, which allowed troops to carry more equipment, and swiftly move through thick jungle terrain. Royal engineers, equipped with demolition charges, destroyed over a hundred bridges during the retreat, yet this did little to delay the Japanese. By the time the Japanese had captured Singapore, they had suffered 9,657 casualties, Allied losses totaled 145,703, including 15,703 casualties and 130,000 captured. Chapter 1 – Background Chapter 1 – Section 1 – Japanese. By 1941 the Japanese had been engaged for four years in trying to subjugate China. They were heavily reliant on imported materials for their military forces, particularly oil from the United States. From 1940 to 1941, the United States, the United Kingdom, and the Netherlands imposed embargoes on supplying oil and war materials to Japan. The object of the embargoes was to assist the Chinese and encourage the Japanese to halt military action in China. The Japanese considered that pulling out of China would result in a loss of face and decided instead to take military action against US, British and Dutch territories in Southeast Asia. The Japanese forces for the invasion were assembled in 1941 on Hainan Island and in French Indochina. This troop, build-up, was noticed by the Allies and, when asked, the Japanese advised that it related to its operations in China. When the Japanese invaded, they had over 200 tanks, consisting of the Type 95 Argo, Type 97 Chiha, Type 89 Igo and Type 97 Tekei. In addition, they had over 500 combat aircraft available. Commonwealth troops were equipped with the Lanchester 6x4 armored car, Marmon Harrington armored car, universal carrier and only 23 obsolete MKV light tanks, none of which were sufficiently armed for armored warfare. They had just over 250 combat aircraft, but half of these were destroyed inside the first few days of combat. Chapter 1 Section 2 Commonwealth Between the wars, the British military strategy in the Far East was undermined by a lack of attention and funding. In 1937, Major General William Dobby, General Officer Commanding Malaya, looked at Malaya's defences and reported that during the monsoon season, from October to March, landings could be made by an enemy on the east coast and bases could be established in Siam. He predicted that landings could be made at Songkla and Patoni in Siam, and Kota Baru in Malaya. He recommended large reinforcements to be sent immediately. His predictions turned out to be correct, but his recommendations were ignored. The British government's plans relied primarily on the stationing of a strong fleet at the Singapore naval base in the event of any enemy hostility, in order to defend both Britain's Far Eastern possessions and the route to Australia. A strong naval presence was also thought to act as a deterrent against possible aggressors. By 1940, however, the army commander in Malaya, Lieutenant General Lionel Bond, conceded that a successful defense of Singapore demanded the defense of the whole peninsula, and that the naval base alone would not be sufficient to deter a Japanese invasion. Military planners concluded that the desired Malayan Air Force strength would be 300 to 500 aircraft, but this was never reached because of the higher priorities in the allocation of men and material for Britain and the Middle East. But the defense strategy for Malaya rested on two basic assumptions, first, that there would be sufficient early warning of an attack to allow for reinforcement of British troops, and second, that American help was at hand in case of attack. By late 1941, after Lieutenant General Arthur E. Percival had taken over as Gork Malaya, 
it became clear that neither of these assumptions had any real substance. In addition, Churchill and Roosevelt had agreed that in the event of war breaking out in Southeast Asia, priority would be given to finishing the war in Europe. The East, until that time, would be a secondary priority. Containment was considered the primary strategy in the East. Chapter 1 Section 3 Intelligence Operations Planning for this offensive was undertaken by the Japanese Military Affairs Bureau's Unit 82 based in Taiwan. Intelligence on Malaya was gathered through a network of agents which included Japanese embassy staff, disaffected Malayans, and Japanese, Korean, and Taiwanese business people and tourists. Japanese spies, which included a British intelligence officer, Captain Patrick Stanley Vaughan Heenan, also provided intelligence and assistance. Prior to hostilities, Japanese intelligence officers like Iwochi Fujiwara had established covert intelligence offices that linked up with the Malay and Indian pro independence organizations such as Kesachu and Malayu Mudda in Malaya Indian Independence League. The Japanese gave these movements financial support in return for their members providing intelligence and later assistance in determining allied troop movements, strengths, and dispositions prior to the invasion. Through the operation of these networks prior to the invasion, the Japanese knew where the Commonwealth forces were based and their unit strengths, had good maps of Malaya, and had local guides available to provide them with directions. Chapter 1, Section 4, November 1941. In November 1941, the British became aware of the large scale buildup of Japanese troops in French Indochina. Thailand was seen to be under threat from this build-up as well as Malaya. British strategists had foreseen the possibility of Thailand's Kra Isthmus being used by the Japanese to invade Malaya. To counteract this potential threat, plans for a preemptive invasion of southern Thailand, named Operation Matador, had been drawn up. By the time the invasion had become highly likely, the British decided not to use Operation Matador for political reasons. Chapter 2, Japanese Invasion of Malaya The Malayan campaign began when the 25th Army, under the command of Lieutenant General Tomoyuki Yamashita, invaded Malaya on 8 December 1941. Japanese troops launched an amphibious assault on the northern coast of Malaya at Kotabaru and started advancing down the eastern coast of Malaya. Japanese forces also landed at Patoni and Songkla in Thailand, then moved south across the Thailand-Malayan border to attack the western portion of Malaya. French Indochina was still under French administration, and had little option but to cooperate with the Japanese. The French authorities therefore submitted to the Japanese military using the territory's ports as naval bases, building air bases, and massing forces there for the invasion. Japan also coerced Thailand into cooperating with the invasion, Though Thai troops resisted the landings in Thai territory for eight hours. At four o'clock, 17 Japanese bombers attacked Singapore, the first ever air raid on the colony. It became evident to the British that Japanese bombers based in Indochina were now within range of Singapore. The Japanese were initially resisted by three corps of the Indian Army and several British Army battalions. The Japanese quickly isolated individual Indian units defending the coastline, before concentrating their forces to surround the defenders and force their surrender. The Japanese forces held a slight advantage in numbers in northern Malaya, and were significantly superior in close air support, armor, coordination, tactics and experience, Japanese units having fought in the Second Sino-Japanese War. The Allies had no tanks which had put them at a severe disadvantage. The Japanese also used bicycle infantry and light tanks, which allowed swift movement of their forces over land through terrain covered with thick tropical rainforest, albeit crisscrossed by native paths. Although the Japanese had not brought bicycles with them, they knew from their intelligence that suitable machines were plentiful in Malaya and quickly confiscated what they needed from civilians and retailers. A replacement for Operation Matador, named Operation Crocol by British Indian Army, was implemented on 8 December, but the troops were easily defeated by the Royal Thai Police and the Japanese 5th Division, which had landed in Patani Province, Thailand. Force Z of the Royal Navy had arrived right before the outbreak of hostilities. 
Powerful Japanese air forces in Indochina achieved the sinking of Prince of Wales and Repulse on 10 December, leaving the east coast of Malaya exposed, allowing the Japanese to continue their landings. Chapter 3, Air War Chapter 3 Section 1, Background As a lower priority theater, the Allies had comparatively few modern aircraft to challenge the Japanese. In addition the Allies did not consider Japanese aircraft a significant threat. In 1941 the Allies assumed that Japan would only have a few hundred poor quality outdated aircraft. The respected James All the World's aircraft for 1941 indicated that the Japanese only had a cluster of dated foreign and indigenous aircraft. Japanese pilots were also underrated, considered unlikely to make particularly good pilots. Prior to the invasion on 8 December there were 75 Allied aircraft, stationed in northern Malaya, and 83 in Singapore. The only fighter squadron in northern Malaya was No. 21 Squadron RAF that was equipped with 12 Brewster Buffaloes. The Japanese had at least 459 aircraft available. Chapter 3 Section 2, Japanese Aircraft and Units the Japanese Navy's 22nd Air Flotilla with 110 aircraft and commanded by Vice Admiral Matsunaga Seidaichi operating out of three air bases near Saigon took part in the initial attacks on Malaya. The 22nd Air Flotilla included the 22nd, Baihoro, and Kanoya Air Groups. They were equipped with 33 Type 96 Mitsubishi G3 M1L bombers. The air flotilla also had 25 Type 96 Mitsubishi A5M4 clawed fighters available. The Jensen Air Group was a key participant in the sinking of the British capital ships HMS Prince of Wales and HMS Repulse off the coast of Malaya on 10 December 1941, losing one aircraft and its crew during the battle. On the 22nd of January 1942, bombers from the Jensen Air Group attacked Kolong Airport in Singapore and subsequently provided air support for Japanese offensives in Malaya including the landings at Indao. The Japanese 3rd Air Corps and three air combat groups of the 5th Air Corps took part in the Malaya campaign. In total there were 354 Imperial Japanese Army Air Service first-line aircraft involved together with the 110 Imperial Japanese Navy Air Service aircraft. The Army units were variously equipped with fighters, Nakajima Ki-27 Nate, Nakajima Ki-43 Oscar, Mitsubishi Ki-51 Sonya, Bombers, Kawasaki Ki-48 Lily, Mitsubishi Ki-21 Sally, Mitsubishi Ki-30 An, and Reconnaissance, Mitsubishi Ki-15 Babs, Mitsubishi Ki-46 Dina. Most Japanese pilots of the IJAS units and at least a quarter of the INA's pilots had combat experience against the Chinese and the Soviets. They were all very well trained. Chapter 3 Section 3, Allied Aircraft and Units Prior to the commencement of hostilities the Allies in Malaya and Singapore had four fighter squadrons, 21 and 453 RAF, 243 RAF, and 488 Runzef. They were equipped with the Brewster Buffalo B-399E, a plane that aviation historian Dan Ford characterized as pathetic. Its engine had fuel starvation problems and poor supercharger performance at higher altitudes. Maneuverability was poor and the engine tended to overheat in the tropical climate, spraying oil over the windscreen. In service, some effort was made to improve performance by removing the armor plate, armored windshields, radios, gun camera, and all other unnecessary equipment, and by replacing the .50 in machine guns with .303 in machine guns. The fuselage tanks were filled with a minimum of fuel and run on high-octane aviation petrol where available. The remaining offensive aircraft consisted of four RAF squadrons of Bristol Blenheim 1 and four light bombers, two RAF squadrons of Lockheed Hudson's, and two RAF squadrons of Vickers Wildebeest torpedo bombers. The Wildebeests were considered obsolete for the European theater of operations. Number 36 Squadron had some fairy albacore biplanes. 
There were also two PBY Catalina flying boats of No. 205 Squadron RAF and three Catalinas from the Royal Netherlands East Indies Army Air Force at Singapore. The squadrons were beset by numerous problems including inadequate spare parts and a lack of support staff, airfields that were difficult to defend against air attack with no early warning of impending attacks, a lack of a clear and coherent command structure, a Japanese spy in the Army Air Liaison Staff, and antagonism between RAF and RAF squadrons and personnel. The Japanese through their network of informants knew the strength and disposition of Allied aircraft before they invaded. Many of the pilots lacked adequate training and experience. For example, a total of 20 of the original 169 Buffaloes were lost in training accidents during 1941. Those fighter pilots with experience had been trained in methods that were very effective against German and Italian fighters but suicide against the acrobatic Japanese Nakajima Ki-43 Oscar and Mitsubishi A6M0. A counter-tactic of avoiding dogfights with a slash-and-run attack was developed by Lieutenant General Claire Lee Chenault of the Flying Tigers but was too late for the Allied pilots serving in this campaign. Two days before the attack on Malaya, No. 1 Squadron Hudson spotted the Japanese invasion fleet but, given uncertainty about the ship's destination and instructions to avoid offensive operations until attacks were made against friendly territory, Sir Robert Brooke Popham, the commander-in-chief of British Far East Command did not allow the convoy to be bombed. Chapter 3 Section 4, Air Campaign On the first day, the focus of the Japanese air assault was on the Allied air bases. Mitsubishi Ki-21 sallies from the 7th Haikodan bombed the airfields at Alor Star, Sumai Patoni, and Butterworth. A total of 60 Allied aircraft were lost on the first day, primarily on the ground. Those Allied fighters that did manage to engage the Japanese performed adequately against the Nakajima Ki-27 Nate. However, the appearance of ever greater numbers of Japanese fighters, including markedly superior types such as the Nakajima Ki-43 Oscar soon overwhelmed the Buffalo pilots, both in the air and on the ground. While contesting the Japanese landings on Malaya, Hudson's from No. 1 Squadron RAF based at Kotobaru became the first aircraft to make an attack in the Pacific War, sinking Japanese transport ship Awatsuzan Maru, while also damaging Ayatosan Maru, and Sakura Maru off the coast of Kotobaru. For the loss of two Hudsons, at 0118h local time. The squadron was transferred to Kwantan the following day. By the 9th of December, Japanese fighters were operating out of Singora and Patani, Thailand, and Kota Baru airfield was in Japanese hands. The Allies tried to attack Singora airfield. The bombers were intercepted on takeoff by a Japanese raid which disabled or shot down all but one. The sole surviving bomber, a Bristol Blenheim flown by Arthur Scarf, did manage to bomb Singora. No. 62 Squadron had been moved from Alor Star to Butterworth, and on 10 December it was moved to Taiping. On 10 December, No. 21 Squadron RAF was withdrawn from Sumai Patoni to Ipo, where it was joined on 13 December by No. 453 Squadron RAF. No. 453 Squadron had been sent to protect force, Z on the 10th of December, but arrived after the warships were sinking. On the 15th of December both squadrons were pulled back to Kuala Lumpur, receiving replacement aircraft for those shot down or destroyed. Within the first week of the campaign the Japanese had established air superiority. On the 19th of December the bombers were moved to Singapore, with No. 62 Squadron being re-equipped with Hudson's.1 pilot, Sergeant Malcolm Neville Red of No. 453 Squadron RAF, sacrificed himself by ramming his buffalo into an Oscar of 64th Sentai over Kuala Lumpur on the 22nd of December. Continued Japanese dominance eventually forced both squadrons back to Singapore on the 24th of December, where they were merged until more replacement aircraft could be obtained. No. 64 Squadron had run out of aircraft and its surviving ground crew and airmen were shipped to Burma. RAF No. 1 and No. 8 squadrons were amalgamated due to aircraft losses. This left the Allied ground troops and shipping completely open to air attack and further weakened the defensive position. 
the Genzan Air Group sank Prince of Wales and Repulse on 10 December, which also established Japanese naval supremacy. In comparison, the Japanese army enjoyed close air support from the start of the campaign, and sought to capture bases for their air support to operate from DOT on 25 December, the 2nd Division of Squadron 5, Royal Netherlands East Indies Army Air Force was deployed to Singapore, contributing to the Allied cause before being recalled to Java on 18 January. Several Dutch pilots, including Jacob van Helstingen and August Dybel, responded to a number of air raids over Singapore while stationed at Kolong Airport. They claimed a total of six aircraft, particularly the Nakajima Ki-27 Nate, which fared poorly in Malaya. On 3 January 1942, 51 disassembled Hurricane MK Ebes arrived in Singapore along with 24 pilots who had been transferred to there with the intention of forming the nucleus of five squadrons. The 151st Maintenance Unit assembled the 51 Hurricanes within two days and of these, 21 were ready for operational service within three days. The Hurricanes were fitted with bulky Vokes dust filters under the nose and were armed with 12, rather than 8, machine guns. The additional weight and drag made them slow to climb and unwieldy to maneuver at altitude, although they were more effective bomber killers. The recently arrived pilots were formed into 232 squadron. In addition, 488 squadron, a Buffalo squadron, converted to hurricanes. On 18 January, the two squadrons formed the basis of 226 group. The following day 453 Squadron provided an escort of eight aircraft for five Wiraways and four Ne Glen Martin bombers, attacking Japanese troops on the Moor River. All the Martins and one of the Wiraways were lost. Dot number 243 Squadron RAF, equipped with Buffalo fighters, was disbanded on 21 January and 232 Squadron became operational on 22 January, the same day the Genzan Air Group attacked Kolong Airport. 232 Squadron thus had the first losses and victories for the hurricane in Southeast Asia that day. Most of the bombers were moved to Sumatra midway through January. Aircraft from 36, 62, and 100 squadrons unsuccessfully attacked the Japanese invasion fleet at Indau on 26 January, suffering heavy losses. The surviving aircraft were evacuated to Sumatra on 31 January. In mid January, the three Sentai of the 5th Air Corps returned to Thailand to participate in the Burma campaign and the 3rd Air Corps turned its attention to the Netherlands East Indies. In the end, more than 60 Brewster aircraft were shot down in combat, 40 destroyed on the ground, and approximately 20 more destroyed in accidents. Only about 20 Buffaloes survived to reach India or the Dutch East Indies. The last airworthy buffalo in Singapore flew out on 10 February, five days before the island fell. The RAF and runs of fighter squadrons left for Sumatra and Java at the beginning of February. It is not entirely clear how many Japanese aircraft the buffalo squadrons shot down, although RAF pilots alone managed to shoot down at least 20. 80 were claimed in total, a ratio of kills to losses of just 1.3 to 1. Additionally, most of the Japanese aircraft shot down by the Buffaloes were bombers. The Hawker Hurricane, which fought in Singapore alongside the Buffalo from 20 January, also suffered severe losses from ground attack, most were destroyed. Chapter 4, Advance Down the Malayan Peninsula The defeat of Allied troops at the Battle of Jitra by Japanese forces, Supported by tanks moving south from Thailand on of December 1941 and the rapid advance of the Japanese inland from their Kotabaru beachhead on the northeast coast of Malaya overwhelmed the northern defences. Without any real naval presence, the British were unable to challenge Japanese naval operations off the Malayan coast, which proved invaluable to the invaders. With virtually no remaining Allied planes, the Japanese also had mastery of the skies, leaving the Allied ground troops and civilian population exposed to air attack. The Malayan island of Penang was bombed daily by the Japanese from 8 December and abandoned on 17 December. Arms, boats, supplies and a working radio station were left in haste to the Japanese. The evacuation of Europeans from Penang, 
with local inhabitants being left to the mercy of the Japanese, caused much embarrassment for the British and alienated them from the local population. Historians judge that the moral collapse of British rule in Southeast Asia came not at Singapore, but at Penang. However, many who were present during the evacuation did not experience it as a scramble. It was a response to an order from British High Command which had come to the conclusion that Penang should be abandoned as it had no tactical or strategic value in the rapidly changing military scheme of things at that time. On 23 December, Major General David Murray Lyon of the Indian 11th Infantry Division was removed from command to little effect. By the end of the first week in January, the entire northern region of Malaya had been lost to the Japanese. At the same time, Thailand officially signed a treaty of friendship with Imperial Japan, which completed the formation of their loose military alliance. Thailand was then allowed by the Japanese to resume sovereignty over several sultanates in northern Malaya, thus consolidating their occupation. It did not take long for the Japanese army's next objective, the city of Kuala Lumpur, to fall. The Japanese entered and occupied the city unopposed on the 11th of January 1942. Singapore Island was now less than 200 miles away for the invading Japanese army. The 11th Indian Division managed to delay the Japanese advance at Kampar for a few days, in which the Japanese suffered severe casualties in terrain that did not allow them to use their tanks or their air superiority to defeat the British. The 11th Indian Division was forced to retreat when the Japanese landed troops by sea south of the Kampar position. The British retreated to prepared positions at Slim River. At the Battle of Slim River, in which two Indian brigades were practically annihilated, the Japanese used surprise and tanks to devastating effect in a risky night attack. The success of this attack forced Percival into replacing the 11th Indian Division with the 8th Australian Division. Chapter 5 Defense of Johor By mid January, the Japanese had reached the southern Malayan state of Johor where, on 14 the January, they encountered troops from the Australian 8th Division, commanded by Major General Gordon Bennett, for the first time in the campaign. During engagements with the Australians, the Japanese experienced their first major tactical setback, due to the stubborn resistance put up by the Australians at Hemmers. The battle, centered around the Gemenka Bridge, proved costly for the Japanese, who suffered up to 600 casualties. However, the bridge itself was repaired within six hours. As the Japanese attempted to outflank the Australians to the west of Hemmers, one of the bloodiest battles of the campaign began on 15 January on the peninsula's west coast near the Muar River. Bennett allocated the 45th Indian Brigade, a new and half trained formation, to defend the river's south bank, but the unit was outflanked by Japanese units landing from the sea and the brigade was effectively destroyed with its commander, Brigadier H. C. Duncan, and all three of his battalion commanders killed. Two Australian infantry battalions, which had been sent to support the 45th Brigade, were also outflanked and their retreat cut off, with one of the Australian battalion commanders killed in the fighting around the town of Bakri, southeast of Muar. During the fighting at Bakri Australian anti-tank gunners had destroyed nine Japanese tanks, slowing the Japanese advance long enough for the surviving elements of the five battalions to attempt an escape from the Muar area. Led by Australian Lieutenant Colonel Charles Anderson, the surviving Indian and Australian troops formed the Muar force and fought a desperate four-day withdrawal, allowing remnants of the Commonwealth troops withdrawing from northern Malaya to avoid being cut off and to push past the Japanese to safety. When the Moor force reached the bridge at Perit Salong and found it to be firmly in enemy hands, Anderson, with mounting numbers of dead and wounded, ordered every man for himself. Those who could took to the jungles, swamps and rubber plantations in search of their division headquarters at Yongpeng. The wounded were left to the mercy of the Japanese, and all but two out of 135 were tortured and killed in the Paritsalong massacre. Anderson was awarded a Victoria Cross for his fighting withdrawal. The Battle of Mua cost the Allies an estimated 3,000 casualties including one brigadier and four battalion commanders. On 20 January, further Japanese landings took place at Endau, in spite of an air attack by Wildebeest bombers. 
The final Commonwealth defensive line in Johor of Batu Pahat Klong Mersing was now being attacked along its full length. In the face of repeated requests from his chief engineer, Brigadier Ivan Simpson, Percival had resisted the construction of fixed defences in Johor, as on the north shore of Singapore, dismissing them with the comment, defences are bad for morale. On 27 January, Percival received permission from the commander of the American-British-Dutch-Australian Command, General Archibald Wavell, to order a retreat across the Johor Strait to the island of Singapore. Chapter 6, Retreat to Singapore On 31 January, the last organized Allied forces left Malaya, and Allied engineers blew a 70 feet, wide hole in the causeway that linked Johor and Singapore, a few stragglers would wade across over the next few days. Japanese raiders and infiltrators, often disguised as Singaporean civilians, began to cross the Straits of Johor in inflatable boats soon afterwards. In less than two months, the battle for Malaya had ended in comprehensive defeat for the Commonwealth forces and their retreat from the Malay Peninsula to the fortress of Singapore. Nearly 50,000 Commonwealth troops had been captured or killed during the battle. The Japanese army invaded the island of Singapore on 7 February and completed their conquest of the island on 15 February, capturing 80,000 more prisoners out of the 85,000 Allied defenders. The final battle before the surrender was with the Malay Regiment at Bukit Kando on 14 February. By the end of January, Heenan had been court-martialed for spying for the Japanese and sentenced to death. On 13 February, Five days after the invasion of Singapore Island, and with Japanese forces approaching the city centre, he was taken by military police to the waterside and was hastily executed. His body was thrown into the sea. Chapter 7, Battles of the Campaign Battle of Kota Baru Three transports landed some 5,200 troops at Kota Baru. The beaches had been prepared with wire and pillboxes, and were defended with artillery and aircraft. One Japanese transport was sunk, with two damaged. But after heavy fighting the Japanese succeeded in landing most of their troops with about 800 casualties. Bombing of Singapore Operation Krokol This was an advance by Commonwealth forces into Thailand to destroy the main road at the ledge. The operation failed due to delays in authorization by Percival and resistance by Thai police. Sinking of Prince of Wales and Repulse The British battleship Prince of Wales and battle cruiser Repulse were sunk by Japanese aircraft after relying on false intelligence as to the location of the landings. They had no air support. This was the first time any capital ships at sea had been sunk by aircraft. Battle of Jitra Battle of Kampar Battle of Slim River Battle of Hemas Battle of Muar Battle of Indau Battle of Singapore